You know, never once in my own country was I given a drum roll before speaking. That's a new, new thing. I've got to come up to Canada to get that done. I'm what's known as an apologist. I should probably define what that means. An apologist is not someone who runs around and says he's sorry all the time. That's what a husband does. <laughs> an apologist is someone who makes a case for what he or she believes. And I will not hide my cards today. I am out to make all of you apologists today because I'm going to contend it is no longer optional that you choose to be one or not be one. If you are pro-life, given the culture we're in, given the assaults we're under, you must be an apologist. And that is someone who graciously and yet persuasively makes a case for the pro-life view in the context where God, in his infinite sovereignty, has placed us in this time in world history. And my contention today is, you're an apologist, whether you want to be or not. The question is, what kind of apologist are you going to be? And we're going to help you be a good one. When my son Jeff graduated from high school in 2009, I took him to the beaches of Normandy, France, for a little bit of a father-son bonding trip before we sent him off to do his first year of college. And we went specifically uh, to Omaha Beach. And we went to Normandy there, jumped in a tour van where it was my son and I, the two Americans, eight Canadians, and two Germans. So it was quite a mix to go to Normandy with. And there we were at Omaha Beach. And as we went through the American cemetery there, and we'd gone to Sword and Juno beaches as well, as well as Gold Beach. And as we were there, my son said to me, Dad, let's go out into the water and wade back into the beach the way our own guys would have done on June 6. Now, how many of you saw the movie Saving Private Ryan? Many of you seen that movie? Fair number of you. If you want to know what happened at Omaha Beach, watch that movie. 80% casualties for the first wave of Army Rangers that hit that beach on June 6, 1944. There were reasons the casualty rates were so high. Number one, the tides were all wrong. The guys were told they were jumping off boats into water waist high deep. They were jumping off into water uh, 20 feet deep, 30 feet deep, and they were carrying 100 pound packs. They went straight to the bottom, many of them, and drowned before they even got a shot off. Those that didn't drown survived, but only by ditching their packs. But now they had another problem. They had to run across the beach with no weapons with which to engage while they're being fired at from in front and the sides with inf inflating fire. And as we were standing there at Omaha Beach, walking back toward, I couldn't, be, I couldn't help but be struck by the awesome, overwhelming sensation of what it would feel like not to have what you need to engage. I remember as we were standing out there in the surf, the French tour guide yelling at us, at me and my son in French, come on, come on, you're holding up the whole group. I'm like, hey, babe, we saved your butts in this war. We're staying right here to enjoy this father-son moment. Thank you very much. But as we walked back toward that beach, I couldn't help but be struck with a feeling that maybe some of you have felt. And it goes like this. I don't have what it takes to fight under fire. I feel outgunned. I feel in way over my head. I feel like I don't have what it takes to engage this culture we're up against. How am I ever going to make a difference? How am I ever going to make a dent in what I see in terms of the cultural decline around us? And I understand, it's not easy up here. I was watching your election last spring, and it looked to me like the Wild Rose Party was going to pick up significant influence. Didn't come out that way. But one of the things that turned everything is when Alison Redford made conscience rights for physicians a big deal, and you know this. Look what she did. She made it a centerpiece of her campaign that doctors could be forced to engage in practices, medical personnel could be forced to engage in practices, and here's how she did it. She did it under the banner of tolerance. I'll read you what she said. She said, I'm amazed we're having this conversation, meaning the conversation about whether or not doctors were free to refuse to be involved in abortion business. She said, I'm amazed we're having this conversation because all Albertans want to live in a place where we respect each other and 
celebrate diverse ideas. I certainly respect people's personal beliefs, unless, of course, they're not her beliefs. Yeah, that's what you're up against. But it gets even worse. It's not only at the political level, it's the academic level. You may be tempted to think, we're, we're outgunned beyond what we could even imagine right now. David Boonin teaches philosophy at the University of Colorado Boulder. He's written the most persuasive book defending abortion. It's called A Defense of Abortion. And I actually commend it to your reading. And the reason I commend it to your reading is not because I agree with his conclusions, but if you want to read the very best the other side has to offer, he's it by a long shot. No one comes close. He is not at all a flamethrower. He is not at all a guy who calls his opponents names. In fact, he's friends with the leading pro-life philosophers in the world today. He engages their articles. In fact, he wrote a stunning endorsement of one of the most persuasive pro-life apologetics books, uh, Chris Kazer's book, The Ethics of Abortion. And he and Boonin endorsed that book, saying this guy really gets it. And by the way, Kazer just destroys Boonin in his book. But Boonin had the intellectual credibility to say, hey, this guy's really got it together. But Boonin is hugely popular in academic circles throughout the world. And I want to read you a stunning passage from the opening chapter of his book that gives you a little taste of where we're going. Are you ready? Keep in mind, I'm reading here from the guy I consider to be the best defender of abortion rights in the world. He writes this, On my desk in my office where most of this book was written, meaning his book, A Defense of Abortion, there are pictures of my son Eli. In one picture, he is gleefully dancing along the sand in the Gulf of Mexico with a cool ocean breeze wreaking havoc with his wispy hair. In a second photograph, he is seated in the grass in his grandparents' backyard, still working to master the feat of sitting up on his own. In a third photograph, he is only a few weeks old, clinging firmly to the arms that are holding him and still wearing the tiny hat for preserving body heat that he wore home from the hospital. Through all of these remarkable pictures, there is no doubt in my mind that they depict the same little boy. Now, I want you to listen carefully to what he says next. He says, in the top drawer of my desk, I keep another picture of Eli. This picture was taken 24 weeks before he was born. The sonogram image is murky, but it reveals clearly enough a small, held, a small head tilted back slightly and an arm raised up and bent with a hand pointing back toward the face and the thumb extended out toward the mouth. There is no doubt in my mind that this picture, too, shows the same little boy at a very early stage in his physical development. And there is no question that the position I defend in this book entails that it would have been morally permissible to end his life at that point. Did you catch what he just said? Let me put it for you in real plain language. David Boonin looks all of you in the eye that are pro-life. He said, I'm going to concede your premise that you are identical to the embryo you once were. And I'll kill you anyway. You didn't evolve from a fetus. You once were one. My son Eli the embryo, my son Eli now, same being. He wasn't a blob of tissue back then. He was the same little boy. And I would kill him anyway back then. Why? Here's the answer Boonin will give, and we'll analyze this in a little bit. Because until you as an individual human being have organized cortical brain function capable of sustaining a desire to go on living, you're not harmed if you're killed. And it's not being human that grounds your value. It's having a desire that grounds your value. And since embryos and fetuses do not have the developed hardware to sustain a desire for anything that can be immediately exercised, they therefore do not have a right to life, and killing them is not wrong. Now, some of you might be thinking, all right, I haven't met anybody up here that puts it exactly the way David Boonin does. And you're right. But you know who you have met? You've met people who've bought into the worldview that when it comes to moral truth on an issue like abortion, you should no more claim your view is true with a capital T 
than you would if you were talking about ice cream. Seen this bumper sticker before? Don't like abortion? Don't have one? Notice what that does to the nature of the abortion debate. Changes it from an issue of right and wrong to an issue of likes and dislikes as if we're talking about dessert preferences. Before we moved from Los Angeles to Atlanta 10 years ago, I had my youngest son Michael at the park and I was pushing him on the swing and he was I think five, yeah he was five at the time, uh, almost six actually, pushing him on the swing and uh, actually that was 11, year, 11 years ago, I'm losing track in my old age, but anyway pushing him on the swing roughly back then and a well-dressed woman put her daughter in the swing next to Michael and she asked a question I dread hearing whenever I'm out having fun and not out speaking. She said, what do you do for a living? <laughs> I talk about controversial stuff. I don't like to argue with you when I'm at home. I want to coach baseball with my kids or take my wife to lunch. I don't want to fight with you. So she said, what do you do for a living? I said, a cop-out answer, I do lectures on bioethics. Nobody ever asked me what that is. <laughs> she said, do you talk about abortion? <laughs> yeah. And she said something I'll bet some of you have heard. I don't like abortion. I think it's bad. What do you think the next word out of her mouth was? But I'm glad it's legally permitted because I don't think it's my place to impose my personal views on others. Very graciously I said to her, can I ask you a question? Why are you personally opposed to abortion? She didn't hesitate. She said, well, everybody knows it kills a baby. Then very gently again I said, can I repeat what you just told me? You personally oppose abortion because you say it kills a baby, but you want it to be legal to kill babies? There was stunned silence while she pushed her daughter for a good 12 seconds at least. And to her credit, she turned to me and said, you're right, that is what I'm saying and it doesn't sound pretty when you take the spin off it. She would bought into the notion that when it came to moral truth on an issue like abortion, you should no more claim your view is true with a capital T than you would if you were talking about ice cream. Greg Kokel is right. Our culture doesn't know the difference between a claim about ice cream and a claim about truth. That's the world we're in. That's the beach you've landed on. That's your Normandy. That's your Omaha Beach. And if you think I'm kidding, go stand in the middle of the University of Alberta with a sign that reads, the pro-life position is true and all other worldviews on the matter are false. Will you be tolerated? No. And you know what will get people angry? They won't challenge you factually on the nature of abortion. You know what they'll challenge you on? That you claimed to be right in the first place. So how do we as pro-lifers, despite this staggering opposition we face, how do we make our case on that kind of turf? And I want to give you the three questions you need clarity on. Now here's the good news. You do not need a PhD in philosophy. Although Jonathan and I are going to spend the night together talking philosophy because my graduate degree is in uh, Christian apologetics and uh, he's a philosophy of religion guy and I could spend a lot of time picking his mind but I'm not going to do it I'm going to let him enjoy his night at home uh, you can watch the Oilers tonight and not worry about it but uh, are they playing tonight that's the question oh by the way when I was up here last somebody gave me an Oilers jersey not the cheap one the nice one I had possession of that thing for one hour and proceeded to leave it in the car of a guy who was driving me around, I think. And I tried calling up here, trying to find where that is. So if any of you have seen a Oilers jersey laying around, it's mine. Give it back. And it's wrong for you to keep it. And if you disagree, that's your morality. Don't impose it on me. Well, moving right along. <laughs> Moving right along. That was good. Yeah, okay. That, look for that jersey. I, where was I before I started talking uh, hockey? Three questions. 
Three questions, yes, yes, clarity on three questions. Here they are. You don't need a PhD in philosophy. You don't even need a college degree. You don't even need to have gotten out of middle school to master these three questions. Here's the questions. Here are the questions we've got to focus this debate on. And you have to be clear on them, or we will get shot up. Number one, we need clarity on the question, what is the unborn? Basic question, still up for grabs in our culture. Number two, and this is a biggie, we need clarity on the question of what gives us value in the first place as human beings. What gives us value? You got two competing worldviews here. You got David Boone arguing you're valuable for what you do functionally, meaning, meaning you have an immediate exercisable desire that you are able to deploy. Outside of that, you don't have a right to life. Is his view the right one on human value? Or can we give a better, more persuasive account of human value? I think we can give a better account. And I'll tell you what that is. What, what is the unborn? What makes humans valuable? And thirdly, what's our duty? If we have clarity on these three questions, men and women, I think we can start to change our culture. Now, I will not lie to you. There is a sad, sad thing going on right now in pro-life circles, and it goes like this. We're winning this fight. We are not winning this fight. We are losing this fight, and we are losing it badly. We are not winning it in the states. The vast majority of people in our academic institutions that train the next generation of thinkers are nowhere near holding our worldview up here or in the states. A plurality of American voters did not re-elect Barack Obama because they didn't know him. They elected him because they agree with him. In your provincial elections, it's not sleight of hand that determines who the premier is. The national level. In the States, Canada, we face a worldview crisis, and here's a controversial thing. I don't believe there's a sleeping giant. For years, we've been telling pro-lifers there's a sleeping giant out there, and if we can just reawaken that sleeping giant and get them involved, we can turn this around. I have news for you. There isn't a sleeping giant. More and more people disagree with us at the worldview level. And that means you and I are now apologists. We are going to have to argue our case and make sure the next generation knows how to argue it or we're in a world of hurt. I might as well get the bad news out of the way first, right? <laughs> and try to be a little more cheery as the day goes on. I mean, my jokes are sort of funny, aren't they? Well, maybe not, but we'll move right along. Here are the three questions. What is the unborn? What makes humans valuable? And what's our duty? Let's look at that first question, what is the unborn? There are sizable numbers of people who don't put a lot of thought into abortion. They are indeed pro-choice because they've assumed a worldview on abortion that they've not really thought a lot about, but it is their default position. Many of these people do not ask the question, what is the unborn, before they ask the question, can we kill the unborn? They simply assume the unborn aren't human, and I'll talk about that in my breakout session later today. But what we need to do is focus this debate as a first step on the question, what kind of thing is the unborn? Can we kill the unborn? My answer is yes. If. If what? if the unborn are not human. If morally speaking, abortion is no different than pulling a tooth, I don't care how many you have. But if it intentionally kills an innocent human being, now we need to discuss that. The question, what is the unborn, is the predicate question that needs to be asked before we answer the question, can we kill the unborn? The culture has jumped right to the second question and ignored the first. So how do we focus people on the question, what is the unborn? My friend Greg Kokel, who I mentioned a moment ago, has an illustration I've been using for years because it's very effective at getting us focused on the debate. 
Imagine you're at your kitchen sink washing dishes and your five-year-old son or grandson comes in behind you with your back turned and while you're standing there washing dishes, your back turned, he says, Daddy or Mommy, can I kill this? Some of you younger ladies are looking at me puzzled. You can't imagine that the little guy would ask such a question. Allow me to enlighten you. I have been married for 28 years, as of two weeks ago, to the most glorious woman in all of Christendom. We have a son, 23, in the U.S. Army, just got back from Korea after a year deployment there. A son, 22, in the U.S. Army, just got back, thank God, from Afghanistan alive. I have another son, 17, and a daughter, 13. I have personally heard the question, Daddy, can I kill this so many times I've lost track, and almost always his hands are on his brother's throat when he's asking the question, Daddy, can I kill this? I don't teach parenting classes. Let's just make that clear. Now, um, what's going to be the first question out of your mouth when you hear that little voice say, Daddy or Mommy, can I kill this? What is it? Not why. You do that later when you're on the psychologist's couch, wondering why you failed as a parent. You, you ask what? What has he got? Cockroach, snail, have fun, don't show your mother. Neighbor, kitty, whoa. <laughs> and brother by the throat, you have issues, right? You would never in a million years say, sure, son, have at it, until you answer the predicate question, what has he got? Now, some of you are thinking, Doug, you flew this dude up from Atlanta for that? I have to keep you awake. You've been eating Cinnabons. No amount of cough, caffeine, caffeine, hey, that's good, going to my spetch therapist later. Uh, no amount of caffeine is going to help you overcome that sugar induction. I've got to keep this interesting. Uh, you might be thinking, okay, that's a silly question. But it gets us to the heart of the abortion issue. Can we kill the unborn? Your answer should be yes. If. If what? If the unborn are not human. You've got to answer the question, what is it, before you answer the question, can we kill it? For the last few semesters, I've been taking a trip to the West Coast, to that bastion of conservative pro-life thought known as UC Berkeley in San Francisco, California. Those of you unfamiliar with UC Berkeley, uh, I want you to think UBC and multiply it by about 10. Go about 10 steps to the left of UBC and you've got UC Berkeley. In fact, I think a lot of the professors at UBC got their genesis at Berkeley. Not exactly a pro-life bastion. And I've gone there to debate Dr. Malcolm Potts. Some of you may know that name. He was Planned Parenthood's international medical director in the 60s. He was responsible with uh, leading the charge in Great Britain to get abortion liberalized in that nation in the late 60s. Dr. Potts teaches a class on population control at Berkeley, and I've gone out the last couple of semesters to debate him in front of 600 of his own students. I actually like that. My wife thinks I'm nuts, but I actually like it. I have nothing to lose. Nothing. In our last debate, it was agreed ahead of time that I would speak first as the guest, but when I showed up, Dr. Potts did not so much as even acknowledge my presence. He simply walked to the front of the lecture hall and announced that he would speak first. He had 20 minutes to make his opening remarks. He took about three and a half to four minutes. And he said the following, Scott is here today to tell all of you young ladies that he knows what's best for your lives in terms of your reproductive choices. Scott wants to take his particular theological perspective and force it on all of you whether you agree with him or not. But what I find most arrogant about Scott is that he thinks he's right. Yeah, some of you are already beginning to see where this is going. He arrogantly thinks he knows the answers to the questions of when life begins and what the unborn is. And he said nobody knows the answers to those questions. People disagree. And if experts disagree, who is Scott to claim to know? Does Scott have a degree in embryology? I do. There are no absolutes in embryology, said Dr. Potts. 
and sat down. In my opening 20 minutes, I did what I have done in other debates. I said the following. Men and women, I'd like to thank Dr. Potts for his warm welcome. No. Um, <laughs> that's warm. I'd hate to see what it's like when he's mad at me. Men and women, I said, I agree with everything Dr. Potts just said. He's right. We should trust women to make their own personal decisions. He's right that pro-lifers like me should not impose our views on those who disagree. We ought to butt out of this debate. He's correct that no man should be telling a woman what's best for her personal privacy. He's correct that there should be no laws restricting abortion. I agree with him completely. He's right. If. And at that moment, the two pro-life girls in the class passed out. <laughs> As did a few of you, almost. If what? If the unborn are not human. And if Dr. Potts can use science to demonstrate that the unborn are not members of our species, and philosophy to show us that even if they are, we have no duty to value them, I'll concede this debate. Because I'm more committed to truth than I am ideology. In fact, I told that audience, I'm vigorously pro-choice on women choosing their own health care providers, which is more than our president is for, uh, own health care providers. I don't know if you heard the news last week that Barack Obama uh, was caught lying about you being able to choose your provider and keep your health care. This is going to be a major crisis, by the way. Uh, so keep that in mind. When I said our president, I meant mine. Don't think I was assuming he's yours. I, I, don't, think, I don't think that would go over so well. Oh, my best Canadian snafu. I've got to tell it to you. I'm, somebody remind me where I am. Dramatic moment, and I'm interrupting it. One time at a Canadian conference with all pro-life college students there, I said, abortion is illegal in all 50 states, including Canada. <laughs> I meant to say, and in Canada, but got carried away. So no, I do know the name of your prime minister, and uh, I think Trudeau's a good guy. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> let you harp on that for a while. Um, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist the pun. Uh, see, I'm drinking this stuff too, you know. It's, uh, I agree with Dr. Potts, he's right if, if what, if the unborn aren't human. And if Dr. Potts can use science to demonstrate the unborn aren't human and philosophy to show us that even if they are, we have no duty to value them, I'll concede. Now, do you think Dr. Potts took me up on my challenge? Here's what he said. He walked up to the podium, stomped his foot twice. He stomped his foot once the first time, twice this time. Said, I'm only going to take two minutes to make my rebuttal, and I expect Scott to take only that much time, too. No, sir, I will take my full allotment of time. Thank you very much. He stamped his foot, said this. There are no absolutes in embryology. People disagree. Same thing he said in his opening and then sat down basically. Here was my rebuttal. Now, well, let me just paraphrase the problem here. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to see the problem with Dr. Potts's response, do you? How does it follow that because people disagree, nobody's right? Did people once disagree on whether the Earth was flat around? Did it mean there wasn't a right answer? Did they once disagree on whether slavery ought to be permitted in the Western world? Yes. Did it mean there wasn't a right way to think about that? Hadley Arcus, famous philosopher at Amherst University, puts it real well. The absence of consensus does not mean an absence of truth. But notice the other problem with Dr. Potts' exchange. We don't know if the unborn are human. Well, if that's true, should we be killing the unborn? If you're driving home from this conference and you see what looks like an old coat in the road, are you going to run it over? No, you're going to err on the side of caution. If you're out hunting and you see bushes rustling, as Ronald Reagan once observed, are you going to open fire if you don't know if it's the deer you've been after or your best friend? No, you're going to err on the side of caution. 
This is the problem with our world today. It wants to avoid the question, what is the unborn? Just gloss right over it. We can't let them do that. Would Dr. Potts in a million years argue it would be okay to kill two-year-olds in the name of trusting women to make their own decisions? So why does he do that on, on abortion? Because he's assuming what about the unborn? That they're not what? Human. He'd never give that argument if we were talking about two-year-olds or teenagers. Though some of you might go for that teenage option. <laughs> now, how do we flush this out into the open? How do we flush it out into the open to force people to deal with this question, what is the unborn? I know there are those who concede the point like David Boonin. I'm going to get to them in a moment, but there's vast numbers of people who just want to ignore it. So how do we flush this assum assumption out into the open where we can deal with it? You use a little tactic we've called trot out the toddler. You know what's great about it? You aren't even arguing for your view yet. It puts all the work on the other person that you're chatting with to carry the heavy labor of defending his view. And all you're doing is asking questions to get started. By the way, how many of you would love me immensely if you knew that everything I was telling you in this first session was written out for you online, in notes, and I will make it available to you? Would uh, that suddenly, uh, okay, I've uh, got half of you going, yeah, that's, the rest of you know that guy's jokes are just too bad. We're not going to love him no matter what he does. So, but for those of you that would like them, I will have them available. Um, Doug is, where's Doug? I just saw him. The man who brought me here has ditched my seminar. John, can you check with Doug at some point to see if there's a website for the group? And if there is, I'll see to it that those notes, okay, you do. I'm going to email those notes and we'll post them on your site if you'd like. <laughs> Great. So here's the question I want, to, I want to get to here. No one is going to argue that we can kill toddlers, teenagers, or adults in the name of choice and who decides. We've got to flush the assumption out into the open about the unborn. Trot out the toddler puts you in the driver's seat. You don't have to defend anything. So next time someone says to you a reason why abortion ought to be legal, here's what I want you to do. Don't panic. Simply ask yourself this question. Would this be a good argument for killing a toddler? If the answer is no, the person's assuming what about the unborn? That they're not what? Human. So here's how it would work. Someone says to me, well, how come you don't trust women to make their own decisions? I'm not going to worry about appearing nice and trusting women. I'm just going to very graciously say, I have a two-year-old in front of me. That will be the first thing I say. I have a two-year-old in front of me. His parents want us to trust them to do whatever they want with him, including rough him up in the privacy of the bedroom. Should they be allowed to do that? The answer from your critic will be what? No, you can't do that. Your reply, two words. Why not? Well, because he's a human being. Your reply, one word. Ah, said almost musically. Ah. If the unborn are human like that toddler, should the unborn be killed in the name of trusting people any more than we would a toddler? Oh, that's different. The unborn aren't human. The toddler is. Ah, that's the issue we need to discuss before we talk about trusting people to make their own decisions. Do you see how we just flush that assumption out into the open? Your critic is assuming the unborn aren't human. Don't you dare proceed without flushing that out into the open. You'll chase rabbit trails all day long if you do. Let's try one together. Someone comes to you and says, how come you don't, expect, how come you don't respect a woman's right to privacy? Well, privacy is great when you're getting ready in the morning, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of nice. But should it include the right to intentionally kill an innocent human being? Trot out your toddler. I have a two-year-old in front of me. His parents want the right to kill him in the privacy of the home. Should they be allowed to do that? Your critic is going to say what? No, you can't do that. Your reply? Not awesome. Some of you were too anxious. <laughs> I could see it in your eyes. You were coming out of your chairs. Ah, not yet. Why not? Well, because he's human. Ah, if the un... That was really good. You're much better than the Americans, you know. <laughs> You guys were in key. They aren't. Ah, ah what? 
Not aha. Ah, if the unborn are human like that toddler, should we be killing the unborn in the name of privacy any more than we kill a toddler? Oh, that's different. The unborn aren't human, the toddler is. Ah, that's the first question we need to answer. Are the unborn human like the toddler? Now listen, folks, let me ask a question. Have I even argued for my view yet? For all you know, I favor abortion. All I've done is frame the issue. He or she who frames the argument usually wins it. That's true everywhere but marriage. <laughs> Different rules apply in that case. I see the self-righteous ladies going, that's right, my husband just needs to repent. <laughs> By golly. Uh, yeah, Hetty's that sitting there, you know. I saw that, Hetty. All right, let's try one more. Someone comes to you and says, well, listen, there's too many people in the world. Too many poor people, we can't afford to feed them, we need abortion to curb overpopulation. Now what does that argument assume about the unborn? That they're not here. Would this person suggest killing two-year-olds so we have more to feed five-year-olds? No. So what are they assuming? The unborn aren't human. Don't do this, don't say, oh, we've got plenty of resources. That's true, but don't argue that. Deal with the assumption, don't accept their premise. I got a two-year-old in front of me. Parents can't afford to feed him. They got five other kids. Should they be allowed to kill the two-year-old so the checkbook can balance at the end of the month? The answer will be what? No. Your reply? Why not? Well, because he's human. Ah, if the unborn are human like that toddler, should they be killed in the name of economic hardship any more than we kill a toddler for that reason? Well, that's different. The unborn aren't human. The toddler is. Your reply? Ah. That's the issue, are the unborn human? Now, admittedly, I'm not putting this forward as a way that the argument will end at that point. Your opponent's going to keep pushing it. What I am doing is giving you something to establish clarity. In any discussion, you should always prefer clarity over agreement, as Dennis Prager points out. You've got to have clarity to start the thing. If you don't have clarity, you're going to talk right past people. Clarity comes when we answer that first question, what is the unborn? Let's at least be clear on that before we go any further. I'll answer the question now. What is the unborn? I'm not going to the Bible to give you an answer. I realize we're in a Lutheran school, even a Missouri Synod affiliated school where the Bible is respected, but I'm not going to go to the Bible. I'm not going to the teaching magisterium of the Catholic Church. I'm not going to philosophy. I'm going to the only place you should go to answer the question, what is the unborn? The science of embryology. The question, what is the unborn, is not a religious question, though Dr. Potts wanted to make it one. The question, what is the unborn, is an inherently empirical question that needs an empirical answer. How we value the unborn is philosophy. But the empirical question comes first. What is it? What kind of thing is the unborn? Answer, and I'll give it to you in a sentence, from the earliest stages of development, you were a distinct, living, and whole human being. From the earliest stages of development, from the very beginning, you were a distinct, living, whole human being. Hold your hand out like this. Take this hand and start pinching a bunch of skin cells off the back of your hand. This serves two functions, wakes you up and makes my illustration work. All right, ready? Pinch hard. Congratulations, you just sent a couple of hundred cells hurling to their deaths on the desk in front of you. These somatic cells, Get this, each one of them contains your DNA encoding. Have you just committed mass homicide? He's going, yeah, dude, dude, we did. We did. Call the cops, bring them in. All right. You didn't. Now, what's interesting is very soon, we're going to be able to take one of these somatic cells that you just plucked off the back of your hand. We're going to be able to take a female egg cell, strip its contents, slap your donor DNA in that evacuated egg cell, add chemicals and electricity and jolt it into reproducing as a clone 
that shares your near genetic markup. That's not if, it's when. It's coming. We already do it with cloning techniques with animals. That's what gave us Dolly the cloned sheep. It's called somatic cell nuclear transfer. But you don't believe you just committed mass murder. And I'll tell you why you don't. Because you rightly distinguished between the cells that are merely part of a larger human entity, you, and the whole living entity you were, even at the embryonic stage. There's a difference in kind between cells that are merely parts of a larger human being and living whole embryos that are not parts of another human being but are themselves distinguished. Everybody see that distinction so far? That's what we've got to make clear to people at the scientific level. Now, there's going to be people who don't accept this, and I'll give you a couple of objections. They'll say things like this. Well, how can that be a complete living whole human being when that embryo can split into two? Twinning can occur. Twinning can occur sometime between 14 to 28 days. Uh, how do you say that that embryo at the very beginning is one of us? Interesting objection, but here's my question. How does it follow that because an entity may split, a living entity may split, that it wasn't a whole living being prior to the split? What happens if you cut a flatworm in half, to borrow an example from my friend Patrick Lee? What do you get? Two flatworms. Was there no flatworm prior to the split? The fact that an entity may split does not mean it wasn't a whole living thing prior to the split. The fact that embryo may divide does not mean it wasn't living prior to the divide. Another objection you'll get, people will say, well, women don't grieve miscarriages the way that they grieve the death of a toddler or even an infant. That may or may not be true, and I suggest you don't challenge it at this point. I actually know women who do grieve the loss of miscarriages, but that's not what you should argue at this point. Do that a minute later. Question, how does it follow that because I grieve the death of one human over another, that the one I don't grieve wasn't one of us? If I got a text message indicating that one of my own children died while I'm up here lecturing, am I going to grieve that news more than hearing that 600 children died today in third world countries from malnutrition? I am, aren't I? Does it follow those children are less human than my own? No, it just means I have an emotional attachment to them that is far deeper than those kids I don't know. It doesn't follow those other kids are not human. Third argument you'll get. Well, nature's the biggest abortionist. Why, up to two-thirds of all conceptions spontaneously abort nature itself or your own Christian God is causing the vast majority of abortions. Therefore, since your God is sovereign, he seems to be in the abortion business. Why are you opposing it? This is a classic example of the is-ought fallacy. How does it follow that because nature spontaneously causes a miscarriage that A, the embryos in question were not human, or B, we may intentionally end their lives. Earthquakes in third world countries cause millions to die. What was that earthquake? Uh, actually, let's use the tsunami example. That one in, uh, there was one in Indonesia and one in Japan. Both of them caused horrific losses of life. Does it follow that because nature causes people to die, mass murder is justified? This is a silly argument, but it's one we get a lot. A third one, fourth one actually, people will use the famous burning research lab example. This building is on fire. In that corner over there is a newborn. In that corner up there is a vial full of frozen embryos. You only have time to save one or the other. Which one are you going to save? Well, we're all going for the newborn. And our critics then say, see, even you don't believe these embryos are fully human because if you did, you would at least consider saving the embryos, all right? Question, how does it follow that because I choose to save one human over others that the ones left behind are not fully human? This building is on fire. I can save all of you or my 13-year-old daughter, Emily Rose. Who's going to fry? 
all of you. <laughs> Diplomacy is not my strong suit. Now, does it follow you're not fully human? No. I won't shoot you on the way out, but I'm going to save her first. The fact I save her over you does not mean you're not fully human. These arguments are not strong, but they're heard all the time by people you live with, go to school with, and dare I say, at times even worship with. We've got to know how to respond to them. Uh, another reason why the scientific side of this gets hard for people to grasp, they confuse construction with development. Philosopher Richard Stith has a great way of uh, illustrating this. He said your average person, for example, Michael uh, Kinsley, journalist, has written and argues that embryos are mere clumps of cells. They're just thrown together parts of bodies. That's false. Embryos are not constructed part by part. They develop. And he uses a great example. He says, imagine you're at the Corvette factory watching a car, car be put together piece by piece. I've been to the Corvette factory in Bow Bowling Green, Kentucky. And you can watch that Corvette from when the first two metal plates are put together to when it rolls off the assembly line if you hang around long enough. Do you think we got a Corvette when the first two metal plates are welded together? No. Those metal plates could be used for a barbecue, lawn furniture. How about when the frame is added in the suspension? Help me out, guys. Are you tempted then? Eh. How about when the powertrain is added? Engine, tranny, that guy's going, now we're getting close. How about when the body's attached to the frame? More people nodding. Some of you skeptics are going to hold out till the wheels touch the ground. That's OK. Here's my point. Nobody here thinks you got a Corvette when the first two metal plates are put together, and rightfully so. But men and women, when you were an embryo, you did something no constructed thing like a Corvette ever did. You developed yourselves from within. There wasn't an outside builder putting you together piece by piece. You know how God engineered human reproduction? So he engineered it so that from the very beginning, that living embryo drives its own internal development. The mother's not the one in charge of the development at that point. The new human entity is. No Corvette ever pulled a stunt like that off. No Corvette ever crawled off the assembly line of its own power. But when you were an embryo, you developed from within. That's what the science of embryology teaches us. Why is this hard for some people? One reason, they don't want to understand. Yeah. It's ignorance sustained by denial, as Greg Cunningham puts it. How do we reach those people? Answer, you give them a chance to view what's actually at stake in the abortion debate. If you saw the movie, The Passion of the Christ, can I see your hands? I think that's just about all of us. 103 minutes of some of the most graphic, horrific imagery, and your church went to it. Your pastors took people to see it. You encourage fellow parishioners and believers to see it. Why? Because you reasoned, and your pastoral leadership reasoned, that unless people saw what our Lord went through, they wouldn't connect with his passion the way they ought to. I have to agree with that. The abortion issue is no different. There are people who will continue to think of it as a personal preference issue until they see it. And I know there's controversy in the pro-life movement about using visual aids. You got one group that says, use them all over the place. Got another group that says we shouldn't use them at all. I think there's a third alternative. Use them well. And when they're used well, they change hearts and minds in a way that no words ever could. I'm going to show you a very short 55-second clip that I showed at my debate with Dr. Potts. We show it at Catholic and Protestant high schools all across America when my speaking team goes out into schools. And this video, though it doesn't show an abortion, it does show the aftermath. So I'll warn you, it's graphic, it's disturbing. You may not want to watch it. And we've respected you. You can look away. There's no narration if you don't want to watch it. Secondly, this clip is so short that looking away will not be burdensome to you. I promise you that. So if you want to avoid it, you won't hear anything, and it won't be long. Another thing I want to say, please hear me on this. I didn't fly up here to Alberta 
to beat people up who may be here today who've had experience with abortion. I don't know who's here. I know a few of you from past trips. But it's more than likely someone here is listening to me and abortion is not an abstract issue for you. It's personal. Or you're close to someone who it's personal for. I'm not here to beat you up and it's because I'm a believer in the gospel of Jesus. Today I'm giving you a largely secular defense of the pro-life view, but I'm going to step outside that secular for a moment. And I'm going to talk about truth with a capital T as it applies to the gospel. I believe the gospel is true with a capital T. I do not believe in Christianity because it works for me. Quite frankly, it's one of the worst world religions if we're just looking at what makes me feel good. Because it does not. I'm a believer in it because I believe Jesus of Nazareth really did die and rise from the dead. It's historical. And I believe there's good evidence for it. And that gospel of Jesus says this, that God created a good world with people to worship and enjoy him, but we rebelled against our maker, set ourselves up as God, and God who had every right to destroy the race for its rebellion. I mean, think about that for a moment. If God saved no one, would he have still been a just God? Yes, because we'd be getting exactly what we deserve. But instead of giving us what we deserve, God sent Jesus, the sinless one, to bear in full his wrath against sin. We don't like that word wrath in today's egalitarian culture. We think it sounds mean. You know what? God's wrath is just his settled hatred of sin. And if God is just, he has to punish sin. If he sweeps it under the rug, he's no longer a just God. His character is impugned. God did punish sin by pouring out his wrath for it on a substitute, Jesus, who bore it in full so that those who trust in him alone for salvation are forgiven. You know what I call that? Very good news for rebels like me and you. But the news gets better. For those who trust in the Son's saving work on their behalf, God the Father is no longer their judge, he's their dad. And he adopts them into his family as dearly loved children. If you're here today and you've had an experience with abortion, you don't need an excuse. You need what I need, forgiveness. You need what everybody here needs, forgiveness. We don't just do bad things, we are bad by nature. We're a rebel race. And yet God has made a way. If you need to talk with someone today, the prayer room was mentioned. Please take advantage of that. See me, see anyone else. We'll be glad to talk with you. Let's keep that good news in mind as we take a moment to view this short cliff. Clip, clip, pardon me. Uh, jet lag is a terrible thing. Um, we'll view this uh, short clip, and then I'm going to wrap up very quickly with the final two questions, and we'll take our break. So without further delay, is there a way to darken the lights during the so that those who want to look away can? <laughs> oh, you know what? It's up to me to start this thing. Um, yeah, go ahead and make the room completely dark so I can't see what I'm doing. Uh, Uh-oh. I have to sign on again, it says. Concordia. Concordia. It still doesn't like me. Do I have to use uppercase? My spelling's just bad. There you go. I have the hourglass, so it will go. There we go.
You might wonder, is it necessary to show something that dramatic to make our case? I went to the Holocaust Museum with my youngest son this last January in D.C. If you've not been, I encourage you to go. And of course covers what happened in World War II with the Jews and Poles. And when you start the tour of that museum, you start on the third floor, and they walk you by a plaque where there's this engraving in a picture of Dwight D. Eisenhower, the Supreme Allied Commander in World War II. Dwight D. Eisenhower is saying to the journalist he's talking to that he has just seen something that goes beyond anything he could describe. It's interesting the backstory to that. For months, a Jewish aide to Eisenhower had bugged him to go see one of the de Nazi death camps, and Eisenhower didn't want to hear of it. He was just not interested, felt it was not important, felt he had more important things to do, and personally wasn't even sure it was really as bad as the stories were. Finally, this Jewish aide pestered him enough to where just to get the guy off his back, Eisenhower jumped on the Jeep and went out to Ordorf, one of the most notoriously awful camps. Eisenhower got out of the Jeep. The stench overwhelmed him. And after he ducked behind a building and finished throwing up, he came back to his aide and said, get every American commander on the phone you can get within 50 miles of this place. I'm told the American soldier doesn't know what he's fighting for. When he sees this, he'll know what he's fighting against. That Jewish aide had to have the courage, men and women, to confront the supreme allied commander about his unwillingness to look at a really awful thing. And it raises the question of whether we have the courage to confront gently but firmly our leaders in our parishes and churches who may also not want to look at this but need to. If that Jewish aide had the courage to, to confront the allied commander I think we can have the courage to confront our local spiritual leaders, gently but firmly. All right, I wrap up with these last two questions, and then we're going to take a break. What makes us valuable? I will unpack this more in my second session, or my breakout session, but here you go. You know the answer if you're a Christian. You have value because you bear the image of God. But what about a secular world that doesn't accept that answer? How do you reach them? Here's a way you do it. You ask a very simple question. Do you have value and a right to life? When the person says yes, which they almost always do, you follow up with this question. What difference is there between the embryo you once were and the adult you are today that would lead us to believe you had no value then and could be killed, but you do have value today and can't be? Stephen Schwartz writes, there's four differences between the embryo you once were and the adult you are today, and none of those four differences is a good reason for killing you. He cites a difference of size, level of development, environment, meaning where you're located, and degree of dependency. Think of the acronym SLED, which many of you have heard before. Size, level of development, environment, degree of dependency. Let's quickly review why none of those are good reasons for saying you could be killed then as an embryo, but not now as an adult. Size. You were smaller as an embryo than you are today, but as a matter of principle, since when does body size determine value? Men are generally larger than women. We don't think men deserve more uh, rights than women simply because they tend to be larger. What about your level of development? You were less developed as an embryo. There's your L for that acronym. But how does your level of development dictate value? Two-year-olds are less developed than 21-year-olds. Two-year-old girls do not even have a developed reproductive system. Does it follow they're less human and valuable than a 21-year-old who does? Environment, where you're located. You were in the womb, now you're out. Where you are does not determine what you are. When you move from your car into this campus building, you change location, you didn't stop being you. Neither did you stop being you when you rolled over in bed last night. If that's true, how does a journey of eight inches down the birth canal suddenly transform you from non-human, non-valuable thing we can kill to valuable human being we can't? Finally, degree of dependency. You depended on your mother for survival, but since when does dependency on another human being mean that we can kill you? There are infants who cannot tolerate baby formula, who can only tolerate their own mother's milk. Would it be permissible 
to unplug that child from her mother and say, we can kill this child because it can't live on its own. Size, level of development, environment, degree of dependency, think SLED. Those are the only four differences between that embryo you once were and the adult you are today. And not one of those is a good reason for saying you could be killed then but not now. I'm going in my breakout session to deal exclusively with David Boonin's desire argument. I'll just give you one quick pointer on that. Boonin, you'll remember, would say, fine, I agree with you, the unborn or human. You're right. You're identical to your former embryonic self. But you've got to have a desire. Embryos don't have desires. Fetuses don't have desires. They can be killed, and we don't deprive them of anything they want. Could a slave be indoctrinated not to ind desire his freedom? Does it follow the slave is not entitled to his freedom simply because he no longer desires it? These are the problems you run into with these arguments. I end with this question. Take me two minutes. What's our duty? Here's the answer. Get ready. You've got to love your unborn neighbor, men and women. You've got to love your unborn neighbor and his mother. How do you love your unborn neighbor? You become a master at the moral logic of the pro-life view. You become an apologist, someone who makes a defense for what he or she believes. St. Peter in his epistle, 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lies within you. Do it graciously, but do it persuasively. That's us. That's what we got to do. Uh, there will be resources available to you today. I will just cite a couple that you may want to look at. Uh, we have a three-pack here. I managed to uh, get them into Canada. I've actually had trouble getting my books into Canada. I'm up front. I don't lie about having books, but once I got stopped because of the title, it uh, didn't happen this time. They're a little friendlier here than they are in Ontario. But um, <laughs> you know that, don't you? Yeah. Wouldn't it be great if we could just cut off everything uh, east of uh, Alberta here? Well, we might let Saskatchewan stick around, you know. I got a friend who's an MP there. We'll let him stick around. But anyway, we have a three-pack available for you. My book, The Case for Life. My book, Stand for Life, co-authored with John Enzer. Great for students. Uh, and a DVD where you see me teaching two one-hour-long sessions on pro-life apologetics, which include that video you just saw. You can get... All three of these for $30, they'll be available. Uh, if you're a student and you're short on money, see me. We'll, we'll work something out with you, okay? Do we have time for questions, or did I shoot past yeah, my... We have three minutes. Three minutes. Okay. See, I deliberately kept the questions limited. You escaped that way. No, go ahead, ma'am. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, what about a woman or somebody who says the woman is nourishing the child? We agree completely. But nourishing the child and driving the child's development are two entirely different things. Um, a test tube can be used to nourish a child, but a test tube does not bring about the child's development. We can artificially feed a child through a test tube mechanism, but that child is not developing because of its external environment, it's developing because of what it's programmed into it genetically and internally. So that's how I would answer that. Very graciously just point out, you're right, the mother does nourish the child, but nourishment and internal development are two different things. Great question, thank you. Yeah, what about cancerous tumors that, uh, drive their own development. We are not arguing that everything that develops internally is a human being. We're arguing that all human beings drive their own development. In other words, we don't want to confuse necessary and sufficient conditions here. Uh, molar pregnancies, for example, seem to start off the same as embryos, but they're not. Uh, Dr. Potts brought this up in his debate. Well, Scott says all embryos develop into humans. Well, what about molar pregnancy? Here's the distinction he didn't make, not that you're making this argument. But Dr. Potts failed to point out that molar pregnancies, these are tumors that appear to have genetic material in them, but they are not organized to the level of a living organism. Everybody with me so far? 
molar pregnancies do not start off as embryos and morph into something else. They always were tumors from the very beginning. Think about this song. I'm going to put two songs in front of you right now. Twinkle, twinkle, little star. And you're all going, oh gosh. Twinkle, twinkle, little star and the alphabet song. Think of the first five measures. Do they sound the same? What happens after that? They change, don't they? Were they the same song from the beginning? No, they weren't, even though they appeared that way. Twinkle, twinkle, little star never was the alphabet song. Everybody with me on this? Molar pregnancies don't start off as embryos and become cancerous tumors. They never were fully integrated human beings. They were incomplete conceptions. Everybody with me so far? Does that answer what you were asking? Great question. All right, one more quick one, then I have to let you go get more cinnamon, cinnamon rolls. Yeah. Post-birth abortions, they're calling them. Yeah, you mean the post-birth abortions they're talking about in the Netherlands? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what we're talking about is nothing short of infanticide, where we're killing infants that are born. And the rationale, now it's interesting, the rationale that's being given for this. The rationale goes like this and see if you agree with it. There really is no essential difference between fetus and newborn. Do we agree with that as pro-lifers? Yes, we do. Peter Singer is right. Fetus is not self-aware. Newborn isn't self-aware. His conclusion, kill both. Our conclusion, something else does a better job of explaining human value and dignity than merely being able to exercise self-awareness. And we'll talk about what that is before the day is done. All right, we are out of time, so you tell us where we go from here. Yes.